In part four of the unit eight notes, we are going to cover how to predict the products for single and double replacement reactions and how to write out net ionic equations. In order for a single replacement reaction to occur, the lone element on the reactant side must be more reactive than the element it will replace. Reactions will occur if the lone element is higher on something called the activity series. Now there are two versions of the activity series and I have pictures of both over here. So the one on the right is the activity series for metals. Metals that are most reactive will be at the top. Metals that are less reactive will be at the bottom. The same is true for the non-metal activity series, which is much shorter. So here we can see fluorine is our most reactive, and then the reactivity decreases as we go down. If a reaction occurs, you will write out the products while crossing charges and balancing the equation. If the reaction does not occur, you will write out no reaction on the right side of the arrow. So here we have a couple of examples that are already solved. So here I had sodium, which was the element by itself, and it was attempting to switch with zinc. Now I want to find each of these elements on the activity series, so sodium is right here, and then zinc is further down. So since sodium is higher up and therefore more reactive than zinc, it replaced it within that compound. Sodium is now bonding to the acetate, and zinc is now by itself. Now you need to notice something else. Over here, zinc was bonding to acetate, and there were two acetates. That was because in this instance, zinc had a plus two charge which crossed down. But sodium isn't capable of making a plus two charge. It can only have a plus one. So sodium's plus one and acetate's minus one canceled out to give NaC2H3O2. Now, once that was done, we had an uneven amount of acetates on the left versus the right. So a two was placed out in front, which fixed the acetates, and then another two was placed out in front over here for the sodium to give you a balanced equation. So you're going to see in this unit that a lot of the individual skills that we're learning are going to be building on one another and will eventually need to be combined. So here we are writing out formulas for ionic compounds, which was from a previous unit. Uh, we are also balancing. In this next reaction, we have iodine. And since this is a nonmetal, we would attempt to switch it with the other nonmetal, chlorine. Now, if we look at this list here, Iodine is further down the list compared to chlorine, so this reaction would not occur. Another way of thinking of this is that iodine is not powerful enough to kick that chlorine out, so I would just write no reaction. That means you do not have to write out new products, you do not have to balance the equation. In our next example, we have another nonmetal, this time fluorine, which is at the very top of the activity series for nonmetals. So that is definitely higher than bromine, and that reaction is going to occur. So I'm going to switch these two elements. That means that bromine is by itself, and now lithium and fluorine are going to be together. Now you might notice that the subscripts are now different. Bromine has a two here because it is a diatomic element, and it never likes to be by itself. So I add in the two. Now fluorine was a two before because it was also diatomic, but within this compound, I now have a plus one and a minus one charge. Those charges have canceled out, which means that I only have one of each of these elements. Then I needed to balance the equation, so because there were two fluorines on the left, I put a two in front of this lithium fluoride, and then now that there were two lithiums, I had to put a two over here. So now I have a complete balanced equation. In our final example here, we have gold, which is the element by itself. Since gold is a metal, I'm going to compare it to the other metal, which is potassium. Gold is at the very bottom of the list. It is the least reactive, so there is no way that it is powerful enough to kick potassium out of that compound. So this is going to be a no reaction. All right, so here we have a couple of checkpoints. And we're going to solve these together from scratch. So in this example, I have mercury, and since this is a metal, I'm going to be comparing it to the other metal, which is magnesium. So mercury is at the very bottom of the list. It is definitely lower than magnesium, so it is not powerful enough to kick that magnesium out. So I'm simply going to write no reaction. In this example, we have chlorine. It's a nonmetal, so I'm going to compare it to the other nonmetal, bromine. Chlorine is higher than bromine, so this reaction is going to work. So that means I need to switch these two. Bromine is going to be by itself. Bromine is a diatomic also happens to be a liquid at room temperature. 
and now I'm going to have sodium bonding to chlorine. Now, just like in that other example we saw, chlorine might have been a 2 over here, but that's because it was a diatomic. That 2 is not going to carry to the other side because sodium is a plus 1 and chlorine is a minus 1. So there's just going to be one of each there. Since this reaction worked, I do need to balance it with coefficients out in front. It looks like I have two bromines on the right side, but only one on the left. So I'm going to put a 2 over here. I now have two sodiums, but only one over here. So I'll put another 2. Uh, two chlorines matches with two chlorines. It looks like everything else is balanced. And of course, if you're still relatively inexperienced with balancing, you could always, you know, put the arrow or sorry, the line down below, count up each of your atoms, just like we were doing in the balancing practice. But this is already balanced. So one, two, one, two. Next, I'm going to show you how to predict the products for a double replacement reaction. In order for a double replacement reaction to occur, we know that we have to get a solid, a gas, or a molecular compound like water. You must write out the potential products first while crossing charges, and then you're going to check the solubility in the chart on the right. Now, there are a whole bunch of solubility rules that you could also learn, but I'm not going to make you memorize any of that. So as long as you could use this chart here, you should be able to figure out whether your products are solid or aqueous for anything that I'm going to give you. Now, if a reaction occurs, you're going to balance the equation just like what we did for the single replacements. If a reaction does not occur, this is going to look a little different. Now, for the single replacements, we wrote out no reaction because we didn't have to write out the products first. But in these reactions, we have to write out the products first to see where they fall on this chart. So instead, what I'm going to have you do is to use the strike through function if you're on the computer or if you're on paper, you can just you know, put a line through your products and you're going to put an X through the arrow. All right, so here I have a couple of examples that have already been solved for you. I had sodium and copper and they were switching places. So now the sodium was bonding to chlorine. Notice it was a plus one minus one so that two did not carry through. And then the copper was bonding to the hydroxide. Copper was a plus two, so there are two of the hydroxides. Now for these symbols here, the solid and the aqueous, that was from this chart. So what I did was I went down to copper, and then I went over until I landed on hydroxide, which is right here. So copper hydroxide was a solid. Then I went down to sodium, and then I went over to chlorine, or chloride, and that was AQ. Since at least one of these was a solid, or you know, a liquid, or a gas, uh, then this reaction works, and then I balanced it. So I put a 2 out in front of the NaCl and an NaOH. In this next reaction here, barium and lead are switching places. The barium is now going to bond to the ClO3, and the lead is going to bond to the NO2. The charges were plus two for both of these, so you know those subscripts happen to be the same as what they were on the other side, but that's kind of kind of a coincidence there. And then I had to look up each of these. So I went down to barium, and then I went over until I found chlorate, which is right here, and that was aqueous. And then I went down to lead, which is right here, and over until I hit nitrite, which is right there, AQ. And since they were both aqueous, this reaction does not occur. Since I'm doing this on the computer, I use a strike through function, and I also put a big X through my arrow. All right, so now that you've seen some examples that were solved, let's try some from scratch. In this example, I have sodium and lithium, and they're going to be switching places. So now I'm going to have lithium. It's going to bond to phosphate. And I need to crisscross the charges here. Now, if you look at your polyatomic ion sheet, phosphate is always a minus 3. So that 3 is going to cross down to the lithium. Lithium is always a plus 1, so there's one phosphate. I don't know the phase of matter yet but I'm gonna figure out what my other product is first. I'm gonna have sodium, which is now going to bond to the hydroxide. So I have Na and OH. And that's a plus one and a minus one, so they just cancel out. All right, so for my next step, I need to figure out what phase of matter these are. So I'm going to go from lithium, which is right here, over until I hit phosphate, and lithium phosphate is a solid. 
Then I'm gonna go down to sodium over until I hit hydroxide, which is right there, and that's an aqueous. Now, since one of these was a solid, that means this reaction works, and I need to balance it. I have three lithiums on the right, but only one of them on the left. So I'm gonna put a three over here. I have three hydroxides on this left side, but I only have one of them over here. So I'm gonna put a three. I have three sodiums, three sodiums, I have one phosphate, one phosphate, so everything else is balanced. In my next example, I have nickel and zinc, and they're going to switch places. So I'm gonna put the zinc next to the sulfate. The sulfate is a minus two, zinc is a plus two, they cancel out, so it's a one to one ratio. I then have nickel bonding to bromine, we can see that nickel is a plus two and bromine is a minus one, so that means I'm going to have two of my bromines. Now I need to figure out the phase of matter. From zinc, I go over until I hit sulfate, and that's AQ, so aqueous. So, so far, it does not look like the reaction is going to work, but we have to check the other one as well. So I go from nickel over until I hit bromide, that is also an AQ. So since neither one of these is going to be a solid, this reaction does not work. I had two solutions, I mixed them together, I still have two solutions. I never got that solid precipitate. So I'm gonna put an X through the arrow, I'm going to strike through my products. All right, next we have net ionic equations. Now a net ionic equation is something that we do for a double replacement reaction which occurs. A net ionic equation only shows the ions that participate in a chemical reaction. We're going to start off with a balanced equation. So here I have uh, Na2SO4, BaCl2, 2NaCl, BaSO4. Now, once you have a balanced equation, then what you're going to do is break apart anything that was aqueous into the individual ions. So here I had two sodiums, and sodium is always plus one. So two Na plus ones. There was a single sulfate, and sulfate is always minus two. So SO4 minus two. The barium chloride is also aqueous. Barium is always a plus two, and I have one of them, so Ba plus two. Chlorine, there are two of them, and chlorine is always a minus one. So two Cl minus one. On the right side, the sodium chloride is also aqueous. So I have two Na's, Na plus one, and this 2 also carries to the Cl, so 2 Cl minus 1. And then I get to the end, BaSO4. This right here is a solid. So since it's a solid, I'm not breaking it apart within the water. It's staying together as one solid thing. So I leave it as BaSO4 solid. What we've just written here, this is called the complete ionic equation. And we need to use this in order to eventually get to the net ionic equation. All right, step three. In step three, we're going to take that complete ionic equation and we're going to cross out something called spectator ions. These are individual ions that are present on both sides of the complete ionic equation. They're essentially the ions that are just kind of floating around inside the water the entire time and they're not actually doing anything. So in this example here, I can see that there was two Na plus ones on the left and two Na plus ones on the right. So I cross those out. Two Cl minus ones on the left, two Cl minus ones on the right, I cross those out as well. Now I can't cross these out because they were aqueous on the left, but they're solid on the right. So they're different, they actually did something. So they're going to be part of my net ionic equation. So now all I have to do is to rewrite this line without all those crossed out ions. Now if you write it in the exact order that it's written here, it would show up as SO4 minus two plus Ba plus two makes BaSO4. And this would be completely valid. But typically we do write the positive ions first. So you could also write it as Ba plus two, SO4 minus two makes BaSO4. So I would accept either one of these as the correct answer. Although if you look up the answer online, this is really the correct format that you're supposed to use. Here's another example that is completed from start to finish. So we're starting off with the balanced equation. Uh, these could all have coefficients of ones this is already balanced. 
we have uh, three aqueous compounds here. One of them is a solid. Now for the uh, complete ionic equation, these three compounds are all broken up, so you can see them all separated into their aqueous versions, but the silver chloride is staying together as a solid. We cross out each of the ones that were aqueous on both sides. Notice only the AG and CL are left alone in the end, and that is what comes down to our net ionic equation. So now we're going to go through a checkpoint where we are breaking down this uh, copper chloride, potassium phosphate, and potassium chloride. This copper phosphate is going to stay together because it is a solid. All right, so I have three coppers. The copper is a plus two. I can tell because there are two chlorines here, and that's going to be aqueous. Three times two is going to be six for the chlorines. Chlorine is always minus one, and that's aqueous. 2 times 3, I have a total of 6 potassiums, which is always plus 1. I have 2 phosphates. And if you look up phosphate on your polyatomic ion sheet, that is a minus 3. All right, so that's the reactant side. Now for the product side. I have 6 potassium plus 1s. And that 6 also carries through to the chlorine. So I have six Cl minus ones. Now for the copper phosphate, this is going to stay together because this is my solid. So what I've written here, this is the complete ionic equation. Next, I need to get rid of all those spectator ions. I see that there are six K plus ones on this side and 6K plus 1s on that side. So I'm going to cancel those out. There are 6Cl minus 1s and 6Cl minus 1s. And that's it. Everything that's left is going to be part of that net ionic equation. So I'm going to have 3Cu plus 2 aqueous. I'm adding 2PO4 minus 3s, also aqueous. And then I'm making Cu3, PO42, solid. So this right here would be my net ionic equation. That concludes our video for part four of the unit eight notes. In our next video for part five, we are going to cover collision theory, factors affecting reaction rates, and limiting versus excess reactants.